This conference will now. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on company cars and electric cars. And over the next half hour or so, I hope you'll be able to get as much information from this as you need to determine whether the company car is for you or not, or whether the electric car is for you or not. As always, we have our chat box. So if you've got any questions and you don't want to unmute yourself, feel free to put a question in the chat box. It's in the top right hand corner of your screen. The session is being recorded and will appear on our YouTube channel later on today. So if you want to recap over anything, then please feel free to watch the recording uh, and subscribe to us on YouTube as well. So then you get notified when and any time anything comes up. We have to start with our usual disclaimer. So the following presentation is produced for general guidance only and professional advice should always be sought before any transaction is undertaken. Individual circumstances can vary and therefore no responsibility can be accepted by Hearts Limited or any of the affiliates for any action taken or any decision made to refrain from action by attendees of this presentation. Sounds like the terms and conditions at one of these game shows, doesn't it? But anyway, um, we normally start off again with an update on what's happening generally. Well, there's not a great deal happening generally, to be honest, uh, in our world. Uh, January's come and gone, thank heavens. And um, the, the main one is the super deduction for capital allowances for new plants and equipment and new vans ends on the 31st of March. So if you want to make use of that, go out and spend before the 31st of March, you get 130% of the cost of whatever you've purchased, as long as it's new, um, as a deduction against your profits. So well worth having a look at. We have a budget coming on the 15th of March, 2023. So let's see what happens with that. Uh, it'll be interesting because we're going to go, we've, got, we've got some tough times ahead. Interesting to see what the governments have got planned for us. So let's just wait and see. And then the only other thing really is make sure you use your ISA and pension allowances before the 5th of April. Um, and I'm sure we've got, a, I've got an IFA on this call and I'm sure he'll be uh, concurring with that and you could always contact him. If you haven't got an IFA, please feel free to get in touch and we can put you in touch with somebody. As always, please look at our other online resources. We have LinkedIn, we post every day on LinkedIn. There's some useful information goes up there. We're on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube so you get notified every time a new uh, video arrives. And follow us on Twitter. And also we're now on Spotify. And we've got some great podcasts on there with various people, which I hope you'll find interesting. We've got more stuff coming this year. And watch this space for that. So you can listen to us on the way home if you really want to. Uh, okay, next webinars. We have on the 21st of March the budget. Chris Bentley, our tax director, is going to be presenting his take on the budget. And we'll keep you up to date on any changes. On the 20th of April, delighted to have Stephen Gomez from Amiga Finance, who's actually on this call. He's going to be joining us and presenting on the current state of the lending market. We're going to look at what information you need to obtain finance, what the current rates are, what you can borrow money on, how to raise finance, amongst other topics. So plenty to get your teeth into there. On the 16th of May, we have, I believe we've got a police inspector from the Cyber Resilience Centre. And he's going to be our guest for this webinar on how to protect your business business with security awareness training. We're going to look at how to protect yourself, raise staff awareness of the current threats and what you can do to protect your organisation from the threat of online crime. So, again, very interesting topic there, I think, for, for a lot of people. And then we're hopefully going to have one on exporting and free ports and what they are and how they work and more of that when we have some more information for you. So that'll keep us going till the summer. We'll break over the summer and start again in September. So today's topic, company cars and what you need to know. Okay, let's have a look at the current position. For petrol and diesel vehicles, as an employee, you're taxed on the list price of the vehicle. So that's not what you paid for it, but the original list price. So for a second hand car, it's still the list price. It's not what you actually paid for it. So for instance, you bought a, a second hand car for 20 grand, but the original list price was 30. You're still going to get tax on the 30 and you include any extras that have gone on there. And it's and it's the list price prior to discounts as well. So your tax is based on the CO2 emissions of the vehicle. 
and the CO2 emissions equate to a percentage as given by HMRC, that gets implied to the uh, list price to get your benefit at what it's going to cost you. So here's the chart, and we need to add in the diesel section 4% for diesels up to the maximum of 37%. Um, and that's unless they are RDE2 compliant, not sure what that actually means, but all new diesels from now on should be RDE2 compliant, but you do need to check. So, for instance, if we have a vehicle which has got CO2 emissions of um, 100, which we've got here, um, it will have a list price, um, say 10 grand for argument's sake. I'm just, we've got a product example coming up in a minute. You're taxed on 25% as long as it's RDE2 compliant. But let's see what this looks, looks like in a real world example. Okay, we've taken an example of a Land Rover Discovery. And could I just ask you all to put yourself on mute if you wouldn't mind? That would be great. Um, examples, we've got a Land Rover Discovery. And this is a list price of £56,000, which we've got here. And for the tax year 22-23, the calculation will be as follows. Well, it's got a CO2 of 220. So if we go back yeah. to our 220, I'm just going to mute one or two people, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, <clears throat> could you all mute yourself, please? That would be great. Make sure you're all on mute. Um, so for uh, our example here, we've got a, a CO2 of 220. That's giving you in this bracket down here, which means you're going to get taxed at 37%. 37% of 56,000 is 20 grand. So for a basic rate taxpayer, you're going to pay 20% of 20,737 pounds. That's 4,147 pounds. For higher rate taxpayer, you're going to be paying 8,000, just under 8,300 pounds in tax. If the company provides private fuel as well, and often this isn't worthwhile, there is a set charge to this, which is 25,300, and you're going to pay tax at 1,872 pounds or 3,744 pounds if you're a higher rate taxpayer. In addition, the company pays Class 1A national insurance on a company car, and that's now at 15.05% of the benefit. In this case, the benefit is 56,045 at 37%, and we pay 15.05% of that. So it's actually going to cost the company £3,121. So you can see for a high emitting diesel vehicle, it's very costly to, the, to both the employee and to the company. So from the employer's perspective as well, capital allowances can be claimed on the purchase of the vehicle and purchase includes buying on a higher purchase agreement or a loan. It doesn't include leasing a contract hire. What capital allowances can you claim? Well, you can see here, not a great deal. So if the emissions are over 50 CO2s, it's only 6%. And if it's under, which you'll find difficult with a lot of cases, it's 18%. So not that great. For contract purchase, if you're buying a car on that, is a much more complicated business. And it depends on the terms of the agreement. If the final balloon payment is clearly well below your expected market value at the time of the final balloon payment, then it is eligible for capital allowances. So say you've got a final balloon payment of say 500 quid and the market value of the car is 10,000 pounds, effectively you've purchased the vehicle. So it, you may well be entitled to some allowances. If you have to make the final balloon payment equivalent to the value of the vehicle, then it's just treated as a lease and so on. So unless emissions are zero, capital allowance is the same for new and second-hand vehicles. So what you can actually claim is very little. Hybrid vehicles. Again, the car tax depends on the miles it can do on an electric charge. So let's look back at our table previously. And we can see these are the ranges which you have to look at. So if it can do 50 miles on a charge, then, and it's a diesel hybrid, it's 12%. Um, if it depends on the amount of miles it can do on its electric charge, and that will determine what the 
a percentage that you apply is. So a car with an electric range of 50 miles will have a benefit in kind rate of 8%. Take the car of, say our car was a hybrid, 56,000. Um, let me just see if I can mute. Uh, there we go. Um, we take our car with a range of 50 miles, has a benefit in kind rate of 8%. So we're talking £4,484 as a benefit in kind, which as a basic rate taxpayer will charge you nearly 900 quid in tax, higher rate just under £1,800 in tax. So a lot better than our straight diesel vehicle, um, but we'll, got, we'll see what it compares like against an electric vehicle. From the employer, the fuel benefit also applies where the company provides private fuel much more beneficial than petrol or diesel but can still be expensive compared to personal ownership capital allowances are similar to that of petrol and diesel so not great amounts to claim and you still pay the class 1a national insurance on it so that's a summary of where we are with petrol vehicle and hybrid i think this is where most people are going to be interested in the electric vehicle so your benefit in kind on an electric car is currently at the rate of just two percent of the list price now, in the last budget, the government introduced an increase of this from, but it doesn't come in until 2025. And it's going to go up by 1% a year uh, until 2028. So it's going to go up in 25-26 to 3%, 26-27 to 4%, and 27-28 to 5%. Still very beneficial. So let's assume our car of 56,000 was and 45 pounds was fully electric. The benefit in kind is just 2% of that, which is £1,120. So you pay just £224 as a basic rate taxpayer, and then £448 for a higher rate taxpayer. So you can see the benefit is huge, and this is the cheapest option, obviously, for the employee. For the employer, the company, if the company buys the car and it's new and unused, and it has to be new, then it entitles to claim the full amount against its profit for the year. So in our example, that means a tax saving of £56,045 at 19% using the current uh, amounts, current rates. That's £10,649 as a one-off reduction in your corporation tax in the company. And when it comes, when the tax rate hits 25%, which is starting to come in from April, then it represents a saving of £14,011. So massive win for both the company and the individual. One thing just to bear in mind that when the vehicle is sold, it will pay corporation tax on the full proceeds. But bear in mind the value of that car will have fallen significantly by the time you come to sell it. So you can see there is a still a massive saving to be made. And if you change electric vehicles on a regular basis, then you're entitled to claim it on a regular basis. So you're always going to have, you replace one vehicle with another, you're always going to be better off from a cash point of view. The employer still plays Class 1A national insurance on the benefit, but that's just 169 quid. So it's neither here nor there. As you can see, buying electric vehicles at the moment is a bit of a no-brainer from a tax point of view. Whether you think they are green or not, that's a whole different issue because everyone goes on about, well, you need these chemicals and this, you're mining this and slave labour and all the rest of it. That's a whole separate issue. But having a green, having an electric vehicle might do well for your credentials, your green credentials for your company. Um, so there are other considerations to take into account as well. But purely from a tax point of view, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, some people suffer from range anxiety. I have to say, I've had an electric vehicle for myself for just over 12 months. It's not an issue for me. So what happens if you lease a vehicle? So where a company leases or contracts mm -hmm. a vehicle, the ownership never passes to the company. So the tax position is different. Where you lease the vehicle, 
um, the lease costs are deducted from the company profits. So effectively, you're getting the tax relief on those lease payments over the period of the lease. There is a rental restriction, so there is a potential add back when you lease a car. And it depends again on the CO2 emissions. So where the CO2 emissions are above 50, then you disallow 15% of the leasing cost that, that you won't get a deduction for. Where it's below 50, excuse me, then you, there is no deduction at all. So again, you can see it's, um, it's still beneficial to lease a vehicle. Um, but the, and, and even if you're leasing an electric vehicle, again, it's still beneficial for the employee because they're not having such big benefiting kind tax put onto them. What about the VAT aspect of it? So if you lease a car, you can usually claim 50% of the VAT back on those leasing payments. You can, in very rare circumstances, reclaim all of the VAT if the car is only used for business and not for private use, but it is very rare and HMRC invariably will challenge that position. Same applies to contract hire or anything that's similar to a lease. There's, uh, there's various ways of purchasing cars. There seems to be more of these coming out every, every few months. Um, you just have to look at the terms and conditions and see what applies. You can't claim the VAT back on the purchase of a vehicle. So let's have a look at a summary of where we are with all of that. If you've, based on our example, the basic rate taxpayer per year for a diesel, this is the tax cost to the employee. Uh, is £4,147 as a basic rate taxpayer. Where it's hybrid, assuming our example of a 50 mile range, it's 897 and electric, it's just 224 And then for a higher rate taxpayer, and we're talking 40%, we're not talking top rate, it's £8,295, 1794 for a hybrid and just 448 quid for electric. So it, as you can see, it mm. makes a massive difference um, when you go and buy an electric vehicle as compared to, say, a diesel, especially, and still get a benefit against a hybrid vehicle. Bear in mind as well that um, all new cars by 2030 have to be electric. They're going to stop production of um, the diesel and the petrol vehicles. So what is your, if you're changing your vehicle now and you intend to keep that vehicle, are you going to be able to sell it by 2030? Bearing in mind that all the new vehicles coming out, and it'll probably happen well before then, well, a majority of vehicles coming out now are electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. So that's just another um, point just to bear in mind to see if you're going to, if, you in, if you're intending to buy a new vehicle, maybe you should be in, looking to buy electric. We want to just cover off pool cars as well, because one of the questions we're often asked is, can I treat my car as a pool car? And therefore, there's no benefit in kind on it. Pool cars, are it's like red drag to a bull for HMRC. They will look at it. So a car only qualifies if a pool car if all of the following conditions are satisfied. It's available to and actually used by more than one employee. It's made available in the case of each of those employees by reason of their employment. It's not ordinarily used by one of them to the exclusion of any others. And any private use by an employee is merely, merely incidental to their business use of it. And it's not normally kept overnight on or near the residence or any of the employees unless it's kept on premises occupied by the provider of the car. And you've got to have all those um, terms in place for it to be a pool car. So now you can see why HMRC find it quite easy to challenge whether a car is a pool car or not. So just bear that in mind. Moving on to company vans. You don't need to report a company van as a benefit if all of the following applies. Available for use and use by more than one employee. Available to each employee because they need it to do the job. Not ordinarily used by one employee to the exclusion of others, not normally kept at near employees' homes, and used only for business journeys. Limited private use is available in this case, but only if it's identical to the business journey. 
So basically you're driving home to allow an early start in the morning or on the way into work, you stop off to buy a pint of milk or some lunch, uh, that's allowable. Um, but you, we suggest that you actually put this into the employee's employment contract and basically tell them they are not insured if the van is used for private use. That will normally negate um, an argument from HMRC. So how do you work out the value for company vans? You need to report a standard value of £3,600 or so to HMRC and it can be reduced if your employee cannot use the van for 30 days in a row or your employee pays you to privately use the van or other employees use the van and you divide that by the number of employees. Again, there is a fuel scale charge for company vans as well of £688 and this can be reduced if the employee can't use the van for 30 days in a row and so on, and you, or the employee might pay back their private fuel. And if you can also pay back your private fuel, ooh, you can also pay back your private fuel if you have a company car as well. Thank you, so if you're being charged. Um, yeah, I'm Mike. Yeah. I'm just wondering how you went on yesterday. Uh, sorry, I've just muted that. Um, so the employee cannot, uh, so you can repay your private fuel if you have a benefiting kind fuel charge. And as long as you repay the fuel by a certain date and repay the cost of that fuel, then you won't get charged for it. What we recommend um, our clients to do is kind of have a use of van agreement, which is basically says what's on the screen there. And if you want a copy of that, please just drop me an email and I can send you a copy of that. You just need to fill in the fill in the blanks and you'll be able to uh, use that with your employees as well. Now, other matters in relation to electric vehicles. So where an employer pays for the installation of a home charging point associated with the provision of an electric vehicle, that is benefiting kind free, so you don't pay any tax on that. Um, and where and that and that the manual confirms that where employee pays for a vehicle charging point to be installed at the employee's home, then there's no taxable benefit. And it also makes clear that a home charge point associated with an employee's own vehicle does not qualify as tax free. So you've bought an electric vehicle and your employee kindly says, Well, I'll stick in a home charging point for you. It's your vehicle, you look after the car. That is a benefit in kind. Road tax, in the, it was announced in the budget that road tax is going to be payable for electric vehicles from April 2025. So we've still got a good couple of years before that comes in. I believe the first year will be about £10 and thereafter about £160. Still good, uh, still a, 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 a very big benefit. And congestion charge, whatever your views are on this, uh, we've looked at, we've had this issue around Greater Manchester about the congestion charge and they spent all that money putting up the signs and cameras and now it's not working and uh, it's all under review. I, I think the, the thinking is that at some point in the future congestion charge is coming and you only need to look at what's happening down in London where they want to expand the uh, congestion charge to much wider area around London, that potentially this could be coming in here. It's also in, in Birmingham at the moment as well. You have to pay to go into the centre of Birmingham. So using electric car will have other benefits for that as well. Um, should you take a car allowance? And if you want to take a car allowance, as some employers offer maybe £250 a month for a car allowance, you're going to pay much more tax than if you actually have the vehicle itself, because that £250 is going to be subject to tax and national insurance at your marginal rate of tax, whereas um, the benefits will be likely much less. If it's for a petrol or diesel car, then it depends on the calculation. And if you want us to give you a personal illustration of it, then just get in touch. We can have a look at that for you. Um, you can you do a salary sacrifice for an electric vehicle? The answer to that is yes, um, but there are rules for it and you have to make sure you comply with them. And again, if you want the details of that, it's too much to go through 
on this webinar just at the moment, then please get in touch and we can let you have those rules. And um, one question I was asked before we started was, is there any uh, grant still available for putting in charging points? Um, the answer to that is yes and no. No, if you have putting them in at home, but yes, if you want to put them in at work and it's up to £350 per charging point at work with a maximum, I believe, of 14 vehicles. Um, so if you are a big operation and you want to put in 14 charging points, which I think is quite excessive, but there you go, um, then uh, yes, you can get a grant for it. It's still available for business workplace uh, charging points. Company motorbikes. Uh, we have come across this in the past. Um, so if the company buys a motorbike for an employee, uh, then we use our example here, say the cost of a motorbike is £8,000, inclusive of that. The employee is taxed at the rate of 20% on the cost. And in this case, this example, they would pay tax on £1,600. So it's £8,000 at 20% gives you your 1,600 quid. That's your benefit. So basic rate taxpayer pays 320 quid, higher pay pays, high, pays 640 quid. The same principle actually applies to company helicopters. Uh, we actually had this with a client where a client puts a helicopter through their business and they are taxed as a benefiting kind on the list price of the helicopter. That's an annual charge. It's not a one-off charge. So it's based on the time that you have that motorbike or that helicopter or any other vehicle uh, in available to you. If the running costs are paid for by the company, they're also taxed on the VAT inclusive amount. That forms part of the benefit. And the company will be able to claim capital allowances on the bike until 31st of March. You can still, and you can claim the super deduction of 130% for this, 100% thereafter. Again, Class 1A national insurance uh, on the bike at the rate of 15.05%. Alternatively, the employee will own the bike personally and they can claim 24p a mile for their business trips. Let's talk about the approved mileage rates. These approved mileage rates have been in since 2012 and have not changed. Um, so I think they're due a review whether that will happen I doubt um, but for cars and vans it's 45p a mile for the first 10,000 business miles and 25p a mile thereafter in a tax year motorbikes as we mentioned 24p a mile and for bicycles you get 20p a mile but you need to keep a mileage log to support this if HMRC ever asks so you keep a record of the business miles that you do um, the company can reclaim the VAT on the petrol element of this but then you need to keep petrol receipts as well. The amounts involved are pretty small. Many people just don't bother with it. It's not worth the paperwork and the effort. One thing to bear in mind though, is if your employer only pays you say 15p a mile, then you can claim the difference between the 45p a mile and the 15p a mile as a deduction on your tax return. So say you did 10,000 miles in a, in a tax year, um, you'll be able to claim 10,000 times 30p so that will be £3,000 as a deduction. So potentially that could save you a few hundred pounds as well. But you may need to make that claim on your self-assessment return. That brings us to a conclusion on a whistle-stop tour through company vans, through company cars, petrol, diesel, electric, company motorbikes, and even company helicopters. So if anybody's got any questions or anybody wants to raise anything, please feel free to unmute yourself and shout out. Or we have the chat box in the top right hand corner of the screen uh, and I'll happily take any questions and I'll try and answer them. If I can't answer them, I will get back to you. So has anybody Stephen, got any questions? Yeah. Yeah, Stephen, what are the mileage rates for an electric vehicle? The mileage rates are the same for an electric vehicle as they are for their other vehicles. So the same 45p a mile. Thank you. Anybody else got any questions that they want to ask? Steve, just one yeah. quick one. Um, yeah. You said before I was discussing this only yesterday, and I don't know whether you've got a cleaner answer on it or whether it's just unnecessary wording. You mentioned before about the super deduction and 
new and unused. Yeah. Are they not one and the same, new and unused? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, they are. Effectively, it's a new vehicle. Or, or you know, if, it, if it's been a demonstrator, it may be not as unused because effectively that will then be a second-hand vehicle. So it would have to be a new vehicle, um, which has just got, say, delivery miles on it. Right. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Much the same for any new plant and equipment. If you want to buy plant and equipment, that's been new to get you 130 percent. Same you can get with vans as well. So if you're looking to buy any new vans, buy them before 31st of March to get that super deduction. Has anybody else got any questions? Yeah, anybody else? Stephen, Stephen, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. For the, 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 the electric yeah. vehicles, the, the VAT, you can claim back 50%. Um, what if the company's not VAT registered? The company's not VAT registered, then they can't claim back any of the VAT. Um, and that's on the, oh, that, yeah. that only applies to the leasing costs of the vehicle. Yeah, OK. All right, thank you. Hi, Stephen, it's, it's Darren. Just a quick question. Um, you yeah. probably covered this, and I probably missed it in between note-taking, so apologies if it's repetition. Did, did you say you can't claim the VAT back on a, on a newly purchased vehicle? Is that what you're saying? Correct, yes. You can't claim VAT back on a vehicle. Okay. It doesn't um, matter really whether it's electric, diesel or petrol. OK, and, and, as, and, as, a, and as a business owner i suppose will but you'll be taxed accordingly when you pay yourself minimum salary and dividends does that affect your rate of um taxation benefit in kind on, an, on any vehicle yes because it depends on what rate of tax that you are actually paying so for a basic rate taxpayer you will pay 20 percent of the benefits in kind value so you have to work out the benefits in kind value to determine what what uh, income that produces so in our example, we looked at our £56,000 vehicle. And if we go back, we can have a look at that. Um, let's just have a look. So we have our Land Rover Discovery here on screen. The benefit in kind was 56000 multiplied by 37%. That £20,737 is treated as income for your tax return for so that counts as um as a benefit so that will then take you if you're on a if you're on say forty five thousand pounds that will tip you over into the higher rate tax into the 40 percent bracket so therefore you'll be paying a combination of 20 percent and 40 percent yeah okay so, so it basically still means electric is a no-brainer at two percent for the foreseeable absolutely yeah and, and the and the super tax deduction yeah yeah. Super deduction okay. doesn't count for the electric vehicle. It counts for electric. It counts for vans. You just get the hundred percent relief for the whole cost of the electric vehicle against your profits. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? In the case of buying a second-hand electric vehicle, what are the tax differences from buying new? Um, for a second-hand vehicle, it goes to the, um, the, the, well, the benefit in kind stays the same. It's still on 2%, but you can't claim the 100% um, first-year allowance on the purchase of the vehicle. So you then it refers back down to the same 18% uh, is what you'll get. So in here where we have our capital allowances from the employer's point of view, we can see we've got the capital allowances. You'll, you'll be uh, 50 grams or lower, so it's going to be at 18%. That's the figure that you'll be able to claim as a deduction on a reducing balance basis each year. So say it was £10,000, the second-hand vehicle cost, you claim 1800 in the first year, and then you claim 18% um, of the 10000 minus the 1800 in the second year, and so on. Yeah, so you end up the month back but over a longer time rather than the first year correct that's right yes yeah excellent thank um, you i've got a question in the chat box if an ev is purchased on a higher purchase agreement can the annual payments be offset against the company profits annually no the way that would work if it's bought on a higher purchase effectively you own the vehicle you get a hundred percent of the cost of the vehicle in year one against the uh, profits in year one it's treated as though you own the vehicle so you can buy it for cash, you can buy it on a loan, you can buy it on HP, and the treatment is exactly the same. Um, the only extra you get will be the high purchase interest on the vehicle will be 
um, deductible against your profits as well. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, yeah, me again. Yes. In terms yeah. of if you keep, you've got a vehicle, it's now paid off, the company's bought it. Yes. If it's kept by the company, what happens then? So tax wise. Say again. Sorry, can you ask the question again? Vehicle and for over four years, it's now paid for, but I keep the vehicle. Or the yep. company's coming for it longer. What are the implications are there? Uh, nothing really. You just carry on owning the vehicle. The capital allowance is a one-off in the year of purchase because you claimed all the all the cost in the vehicle. Um, the capital allowance purposes, if it's not an electric vehicle, you continue to claim the writing down allowance each year uh, yeah. up until you sell the vehicle. When you yeah. come to sell the vehicle at a later date, then any proceeds go against the uh, whatever's left owing on allowing to you on the capital allowances and it might produce either a balancing charge or a balancing allowance but that's all dealt with on the eventual sale but now you can keep owning the vehicle it's not a problem and the benefit in kind carries on on the usual uh, rates yep. yep can i ask a question on uh, subsequent sales of vehicles no matter yes. what presumably there is vat on the sale of a vehicle that you're getting rid of um, the answer to that is no, um, because there is only VAT on the sale of the van. So if a company sells a van, there's VAT on it. If a company sells a vehicle, there is no VAT on it. Okay, and the same. Okay, for, and the same is true for electric, hybrid, or whatever the vehicle yes. is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have we got any other questions? Marvelous. Right, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us this morning. I've got some familiar faces and some uh, some new faces here, and I'm glad everyone's joined us this morning. If you've missed anything, feel free to go back and watch it on YouTube. It'll be on our YouTube channel later on today, uh, and I look forward to seeing you on future webinars. If you've got any suggestions you might want for future webinars, please feel free to drop me a line, stick it in the chat box, and we'll quite happily pull something together for you. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.